now talk about partial differential equations uh, unfortunately this is an extremely broad and vast field uh, of course we won't have time to go into all the integrity details i'll just give you a very broad overview and i'll give you the basic method used to solve uh, that is sign that is that the physicist or engineer uses to solve a partial differential equation that's separation of variables. I'll, I'll introduce that method, and essentially I'll leave it at that. Okay. The idea being that if you if you are, are really become relatively comfortable with with separation of variables, have some idea about it. Okay. I'll give the, the you the method in the context of the so-called Laplace equation, which is one type of partial differential equation. The idea that is that if you get comfortable with applying separation of variables to the Laplace equation, you can then apply the same method to other partial differential equations as well okay which you will encounter in physical applications okay so partial differential equations have many applications they pop all over the place okay so whenever you're modeling some physical system uh, usually you end up with a partial differential equation okay so for example if you're looking at heat transfer if you're looking at diffusion if you're looking at electrostatics uh, if you are looking at electrodynamics in general, okay, uh, you have these partial differential equations popping up all over the place, okay. If you are looking at waves, for example, that, that's that's one prototypical example of a partial differential equation. So there are different uh, types of, as in you can talk about different uh, commonly encountered partial differential equations in applications. Uh, probably the most commonly encountered is the Laplace equation. Okay, I'll write them down and then I'll explain what, this, what, what the symbols mean. So, this is commonly written like that. Okay, uh, you have Poisson equation. So, you have yeah, this is equal to some function of the coordinates. Okay, you have the wave equation. So, this describes wave propagation. Okay, so you have you might be confused uh, that this v square v of course here is the speed of the wave that you're talking about v square is a denominator and numerator it's the easiest way to get that right is just to match the dimensions okay so uh, the left hand side is dimension of u divided by uh, distance squared okay this this symbol del square is called the laplacian it contains the double derivative with respect to spatial coordinates okay so that's why del square u has dimensions of u divided by distance squared okay and you will have exactly the same dimensions here so you have the wave equation then you have the diffusion equation okay you have del square u is equal to 1 over alpha square partial of u expected okay and this alpha square by the way is called the diffusivity you also have of course the, the Schrodinger equation that's also a partial differential equation I won't be writing that down since you probably most of you have already seen that in your uh, quantum mechanics courses okay so anyway if you don't remember that it's, it, 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 it's just an example for partial differential equation uh, you also have the Helmholtz equation so this is del square u plus k square u is equal to zero okay uh, typically you encounter the Hamel's equation when you do when you apply the part the separation of variable technique on the wave equation or the diffusion equation okay right so that's where we are okay. now I need to explain to you what is the meaning of this strange symbol then scale okay this is the Laplacian okay. it contains partial derivatives okay that's why all these the Laplace equation, the Poisson equation, the wave equation, the diffusion equation, the Helmholtz equation, all of these are partial differential equations. Okay, so this is the Laplacian. Okay, and this essentially is the divergence of the gradient. Okay. So, right now I'm currently really 
I'll almost exclusively be dealing with scalar fields. Okay, so essentially a scalar field, as you well know, is is essentially that to every point in space you assign a single number. Okay, so it's not a vector field where to every point in space you you assign a vector. Okay, so I'm talking about scalar fields now. Okay. Uh, so, for example, the simplest example of scalar field would be the, would be the temperature in a in a room. Okay, so the every point in a room you can assign a value of temperature. Okay, and the and then the Laplacian once it acts on the scalar field tells you that first you take the gradient of the scalar field and then take the divergence of the gradient of the scalar field. Okay, that that essentially is uh, is equal to the Laplacian of your scalar field. Okay. So in Cartesian coordinates, if you write it down, uh, you have u that is your scalar field. You first of all, take the gradient. Okay, this you well know is given by in Cartesian coordinates partial u with respect to x dx plus partial u with respect to pi y plus partial u with respect to z dz. Okay, and then you take its divergence. So you write del dot del u. This of course, will be uh, partial with respect to x dx plus partial with respect to y dy plus partial with respect to z dz dotted with this thing above partial u with respect to x dx plus partial u with respect to y dy plus partial u with respect to z dz. And this thing is simply equal to the Double partial derivative of u with respect to x plus double derivative of u with respect to y plus double derivative of u with respect to z. Okay. So as you as as promised, the Laplacian has uh, has 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 put forth a partial difference or some partial derivatives. Okay. So that's what the Laplacian of scalar field in Cartesian coordinates what, what it looks like. Okay. You can you can use this idea that the Laplacian is the divergence of the gradient. Okay. Notice I haven't really, really yet talked about what does the Laplacian give you physically. Okay, I'm just talking about it in mathematical terms right now. We'll soon enough we'll talk about the physical meaning of the Laplacian. But you can give uh, this the use this thing that the Laplacian is the divergence of the gradient to talk about the Laplacian in some other coordinate systems. Okay, so remember when you're talking about some other a general orthogonal or coordinate system, you first of all write down the line element. So you see everything is linked together, okay, with each other. So you cannot really forget about what you did in the in the initial part of the course when you're doing partial differential equation because a lot of the notation is borrowed from there. Okay. So d s square is given by h one square d q one square plus h two square d q two square plus h three square d q three squared. Right, so that's what we had, and you all then we had essentially that uh, that you, we found that the gradient of u in such a general coordinate system is given by one over h one. I'm not repeating this again. I did this before. Uh, derivative of u with respect to q one times e one plus one over h two. Derivative of two uh, of u with respect to the coordinate corresponding to q2 uh, with respect to q2 sorry and this is e2 plus 1 over h3 partial 3 u e3 and then we had the um, we had the recipe for calculating divergence of a vector field uh, in a general coordinate system once you apply that to this thing this thing you find that del square u in general is given by 1 over h1 h2 h3 and you have over here partial of 1 with respect to 1 h2 h3 divided by h1 partial u plus partial 2 and you have h3 h1 divided by h2 partial 2 u plus you have the third derivative, 1, 2, uh, as in derivative with respect to q3, uh, h1, h2, divided by h3, and then you have partial 3. Notice I'm being careful about these parentheses because, of course, these h1, h2, h3 can depend on q1, q2, q3 in general. 
okay for cartesian coordinates of course h1 is equal to 1 h2 is equal to 1 h3 is equal to 1 partial with respect to 1 is part just simply partial with respect to x partial with respect to 2 is partial with respect to y and so on so you get back this expression okay in cartesian coordinates but that's the general expression in in a general orthogonal coordinate system okay i just wanted to put that forward because if you open for example some quantum mechanics book or electrodynamics book where they're talking about the laplacian in for example spherical polar coordinates you might see a very weird looking expression of the laplacian but that is nothing other than the 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 divergence of the gradient of a scalar field expressed in that coordinate system okay that's all it is okay, so no no need to be scared of that Right. So the, 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 it looks complicated because, of course, in spherical polar coordinates, for example, h1, h2, h3 are non-trivial. They're not all equal to 1. Okay. okay, let me very quickly give you a physical example in which you actually encounter this, this, uh, this Laplacian. Okay. And along the way, we, we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll also end up with the Laplace equation as well as the Poisson equation. Okay. So these are probably the two simplest uh, partial differential equations. Um, so Laplace equation to, to let's let's take an example for electro uh, electromagnetism in particular electrostatics. So electrostatics just means that you are you are looking at a situation in which the charges are not moving. Okay, so if charges are not moving, then there are no magnetic fields. Okay. So first of all, we have Gauss's law, which says that the divergence of the electric field is equal to the charge density divided by a constant. Okay. We also have another Maxwell equation which talks about the curl of the electric field and this in general is equal to the derivative of the negative deri of the derivative of the magnetic field okay. however if since we are talking about electrostatics there is no magnetic field to speak of this is equal to zero in this case, okay because v is equal to zero okay now uh, i can using this i can say i can since the curl of the electric field for my situation is zero i can write the electric field as a gradient of some scalar field okay by convention you write this as a negative of the gradient of the electric field uh, of the, as a negative of as a negative of the gradient of the scalar field which is called the electric potential okay if you write the electric field this way then it is guaranteed the, the curl of the electric field is zero okay right fine because we know that the curl of a gradient is zero okay next you substitute this thing over here and so you get that that the divergence of this gradient is equal to the charge density divided by epsilon naught. Of course, this minus. So as I was saying, uh, this minus sign over here, uh, you can you can bring that out. So you're left with minus del dot del v. Is equal to rho over epsilon naught, and this, of course, is the divergence of the gradient, which is nothing but the Laplacian. If you want, you can bring this minus sign to the other side. So we have that del square v is equal to minus rho, which in general is a function of x, y, and z in the electrostatics, no moving charges, divided by epsilon naught. So this is exactly of the form of Poisson's equation. V, remember, is a scalar field. Okay, because I wrote the electric field as a gradient of the scalar field, which in this case is just the electric potential. Okay. So going back, this is exactly of this form. Now this, you have to keep in mind, this is a local equation in the sense that it talks about the Laplacian at a particular point. Okay, the Laplacian of the electric potential at a particular point in space is equal to the negative of the charge density at that point divided by epsilon naught. Epsilon naught is just a constant, okay? If you're talking about points in at which there is no charge, okay, then the Laple then of course this equation immediately becomes del square V is equal to zero. Okay. Because you're talking about points at which there is no charge. Okay. In that case the Laplacian of the electric potential simply is zero. Okay. Or for example, you may be interested in finding out the electric field or the electric potential. Remember, if you have the electric potential, you have the electric field. You're only interested in finding the electric field at points at which there is no charge. Okay. So then you just solve this equation. Okay. 
So technically we say that the Laplace equation corresponds to the Poisson equation in a source free uh, for in a source free region okay where there are no sources of electric field okay Now uh, let's now come to the physical meaning of the Laplace okay so previously i told you way back in the beginning of the semester that what does physically what does the divergence of a of a vector field tell you about what does the curl of a vector field tell you about what is the now what does the laplacian of a scalar field tell you about okay so i'll just write down the what it means okay and then explain where it comes from laplacian of a scalar field okay. it tells you about the difference between the actual value of the field at a point at the point okay so remember you can calculate the value of the laplacian of the scalar field at, at of all the different points okay so if you're talking about a particular point the laplacian of a scalar field tell you about the difference between the actual value of the field at a point at the point that you're looking at and the average value of the field in an infinitesimal neighborhood of the point okay so another way you're looking at at a particular point of course corresponding to that point there is some value of the field that you're looking for looking at okay so for example if you know the the field as u u of x y z gives you the actual value of the field at that point so for example if you are looking at a room i can talk about the temperature at a particular point okay so that's u x y z okay. then i can draw a little region around this point okay i can i can look at the values of the of all the points in this in this little region around this point on around the point, original point okay so and then i can take out the uh, find out the average value by looking at the values of these points surrounding this original point okay so in other words i have u and i also have u bar u bar is the average value of u by looking at the at the value of this uh, by looking at the values of this scalar field at points around this this original point okay so and the laplacian just tells you the, about the difference between u bar and u so it essentially tells you about the difference between this thing and that thing okay before going on to show this mathematically that what i have written down is is true that this is exactly what the what the, the, the laplacian tells you starting from the from the previous definition that the laplacian is the is a divergence of the of the gradient okay Uh, let me give you some idea about about what does this uh, this this uh, physically correspond to. Uh, essentially, this just means that the Laplacian of a scalar field is is non-zero only when there is a source. Okay, and we'll talk about uh, what 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 do I mean by source over here? A simplest example would be, for example, that that there's a you can imagine that there's a very small there's a very small perfume bottle at a point. So here is my perfume bottle, which is essentially emitting some some molecules of a of of hopefully a pleasant smelling chemical. Okay, so you have some molecules, you know, and as you can imagine, the molecules there are more molecules near this little bottle than they're far away. So there are fewer molecules far away. Uh, okay, right. If I now draw a little sphere around my perfume bottle. i can immediately i immediately have this feeling that there will be that the concentration of these of these molecules will be, will be greater at at the location of the perfume bottle very very close to it compared to slightly further away okay so when i draw this little surface okay the the where the value of the concentration of the molecules at this at, at the location of the perfume bottle is greater then the average value of the concentration of the perfume molecules over this uh, over over this 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 volume that i've drawn okay because over this volume that i've drawn there are some points which are further away from the from the perfume bottle and those of course correspond to a smaller value of the concentration of uh, of the perfume molecule okay right so essentially when you take the average 
those only those points which are further away from the perfume bottle will bring the uh, the the average value of of the concentration to be lower than this u which is the value of the concentration pretty much at the location of the perfume bottle okay it's just like for example if you have essentially uh, if you have three students who get 100 marks okay but then you have a four student who scores 60 marks the four students essentially brings the average down okay and that of course means that there is really a difference between u bar and u okay and this difference is exactly what is driving the diffusion okay essentially that this this difference is precisely what is saying that there is a difference in the concentration of the of the molecules okay there is this larger concentration of the molecules at or near the location of the perfume bottle there is a smaller concentration further away okay that's why you have this difference between u bar and u okay and that's exactly what is encapsulated by this laplacian okay so you write there scale u okay now the bigger the difference between u bar and u okay as in the big the bigger the difference between the concentrations the, you can imagine that the faster the molecules will diffuse okay so the bigger this is okay the bigger partial u by partial t okay so you can include a proportionality constant just to guarantee that this is positive we write this as alpha square and that's essentially what you have so this is exactly the so called diffusion equation which i wrote over here okay you just bring alpha square to the other side okay, so that's essentially what, what how you translate this thing to some physical understanding okay so just like so similarly in electrostatics the if you're talking about the source free region this is true when you have a source then when you have a charge then this is true okay because essentially you can think about that there is some kind of uh, the, 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 the if there is no charge then essentially uh, it turns out that this thing u bar is going to be equal to u okay but if there if there is no charge if there is charge then of course the charge itself will uh, will cause a difference to appear between these two quantities here, of course, u will just be equal to the electric potential. Okay. Now let me show you that this statement is indeed correct and it's it's reasonable, uh, starting from our from a previous definition of the Laplacian. Okay. So what we have is essentially that that look at a point. For convenience, I'll I'll, I'll set up my coordinate system such that the origin of my coordinate system is at the point that I'm looking at. Okay. Fine, and you have this point, and you have a scalar field at this point, whose value I say is u naught, okay, because this point is the origin. So the value of the scalar field is simply u naught. And then I also have to calculate the average value of the scalar field in a little volume around this point, okay? And you uh, that is simply equal to u bar. So u bar is equal to. Uh, it depends on 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 which on what volume I consider for simply cell consider little q. Okay. So the side length of this cube is a. Okay. So because I've placed okay, this is not such an accurate diagram, but I placed the 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 point the region at the mid at the center of this cube. So essentially the cube goes from x is equal to a by two to x is equal to minus a by two, y is equal to a by two to y is equal to minus a by two, z is equal to a by two to z is equal to minus a by two. So anyway, u bar is going to be equal to so you are taking the average value of u over this cube, you have to divide by the volume of this cube, and then you have a volume integral. So you integrate over the volume of this cube of u. Okay. So just writing out the typical integral. This thing will be dx minus a by two a by two dy minus a by two a by two dz minus a by two a by two of z. Okay. Right. Now, of course, previously I said that this is in an infinitesimal neighborhood, so I'm talking about very small values of a. Okay, so since I'm only talking about very small values of a, I can do a Taylor's expansion of u. Okay, uh, I have to be careful because u is now a function of x, y, and z. So this is a multi-variable Taylor's expansion on the usual single-variable Taylor's expansion. 
So you at the point slightly away from the region is going to be equal to g naught plus partial of u with respect to x evaluated at the origin okay times x plus partial of u with respect to y evaluated at the origin times y plus partial of u with respect to z evaluated at the origin times z plus you have the the higher order terms, the second order terms, so 1 over 2 factorial, right? And then you have double derivative of u with respect to, uh, by, let me just write this in full generality, okay? Uh, let me write it like this partial i, partial j of u, okay? Uh, evaluated at the origin. And you have over here x i x j. So x one corresponds to um, x x two corresponds to y x three corresponds to z. And here you have partial with respect to i. So if i is equal to one, this is partial with respect to x. I is equal to two, partial with respect to y, and so on. Uh, so this is simply the double derivative of u uh, with respect to uh, with respect to the, the coordinates. Okay. I, I may be equal to j, I may not be equal to j. Here the summation implied, of course. So you i goes from 1 to 3 and j goes from 1 to 3. Plus, of course, you have the higher order terms. Okay. So the idea then is that you just substitute this thing over here and you actually do the integral. Okay. So let's do this term by term. The first integral is easy because u0 is simply a constant. That goes outside the integral. Okay. What is left, the integral that is left simply gives you the volume of the cube and that of course divides by this a cube to give you 1. Okay. So when you substitute this thing into the integral, of course, you just simply get u0. Okay. Next, you have to substitute this thing. Okay. When you substitute this thing, uh, the y and z integrals are trivial. Okay. The y and z integrals give you a. Uh, the y integral gives you a, the z integral gives you a, okay, because the integral does not depend on y and z. The x integral is what you are really interested in, okay. So the x integral, uh, so you actually get this, then you have, I'm just looking at the x integral, so you get dx, then you have partial u with respect to x, x, okay. This thing is, of course, just a number, this goes outside the integral, so I'm just sketching out how to do this integral, okay, it's very straightforward actually. So partial u with respect to x, this is a number, minus a by 2, a by 2, x, dx. And when you do this integral, of course, you'll get 0, okay? Because essentially, uh, if you look at the linear function, there's as much area above the curve as there is below the curve, okay? Or if you actually do the integral, you get x squared by 2. Uh, as you enter derivative and you substitute a by 2, of course, because of the scale, you get the same value for the upper limit and for the lower limit. And when you take the difference, you get 0. Okay. Exactly the same argument applies when you substitute this thing, except that the integral over y is non zero. And exactly the same argument for this thing. And now the integral over z is 0. Okay. So what you really have to concentrate on is the second order term. Now this second order term uh, contains terms where i is equal to j and where i is not equal to j, okay. Now if i is not equal to j, let me give you an example, okay. So if i is not equal to j, forget about this 1 over 2 factorial for the time being, uh, if i is not equal to j, let's take the example i is equal to 1 and j is equal to 2. Then you're dealing with a double derivative of u with respect to x respect to y at the origin, okay, this goes outside the integral, and then you have dx minus a by 2, a by 2, dy minus a by 2, a by 2, dz minus a by 2, a by 2, and you have i is equal to 1 and j is equal to 2, so this xi, xj becomes xy, okay. And you can very easily see that, okay, the z integral is trivial, that simply gives you a, but the x integral is 0 and the y integral is also 0, so of course the overall you get 0. Okay? And similarly for any case where i is not equal to j, you are guaranteed to get 0. Okay? Because exactly the same argument is over here. You get some odd power of your x or y or z and once you integrate that, you get 0. Okay? 
However, when i is equal to j, then you will get something non-zero. So, when i is equal to j, then you are dealing with essentially, you are substituting this thing now for the case where i is equal to j, you are substituting this thing over here, okay. So, let us do the algebra now and I will get u bar uh, rather than writing u bar, let me just write down the integral, okay, because u naught is also contributing to u bar. So, you have 1 over a cube, right. This is this term. Then you have dx minus a by 2, a by 2, dy minus a by 2, a by 2, dz minus a by 2, a by 2. Okay. And now, of course, because there is this sum over i, you actually have three terms over here. So I bring 1 over 2 factorial outside, that gives you a half factor, a factor of half outside. And I have that you have. Okay. Add not okay, and you have over here i is equal to one over here, and j is equal to i, so j is also equal to one. So you have x square over here plus not y square. That's what you have. Okay. So you have these three integrals. Okay, let me just do. You can chop this up, of course, into three integrals. Okay, let me just do the first one. So for the first one, you have one over two a cube, and then this number goes outside, and you then left with the left with the integral of x square. Okay, the y and z integrals are straightforward. Those give, give you a factor of a square, and then you're left with the integral of x square that gives you essentially x cube by 3 and then you have to integrate this between a minus a by 2 and a by 2 okay so that essentially gives you over here it gives you uh, uh, a cube over 8 okay and a cube over uh, 8 so do you get this is 1, one over 2 a cube partial of q respect to x a, a cube over a, so you get a cube over, oh sorry this is plus, right, so you have a cube over 8 and then divided by 3 a cube over 24, but then you have another a cube over 24 from the bottom, that is minus a cube over 24, so a cube over 24 minus minus a cube over 24 gives you a cube over 12, okay, so that's what you have. This a cube cancels this a cube, and you're left with essentially uh, this thing as in the double derivative of the scalar field with respect to x evaluated at the origin at the point that we are looking at uh, multiplied by a square. Similarly, if you if you integrate this second time, you'll get exactly the same thing except that you are talking about the double derivative of u with respect to y. Okay, and then the third term double derivative do with respect to z. So all in all, this this integral over here, as in u bar, is equal to u naught. U bar is equal to u naught plus you have over here. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, by twenty four over here. So you have over here a square over 24 and then you have okay. This thing in the scale brackets of course is nothing but the value of the Laplacian at the origin. Okay, So I can then rearrange this equation to say that the value of the Laplacian at the origin simply equal to 24 by a square okay right and you have over here u bar minus u the important thing to note is that the Laplacian is proportional to u bar minus u naught and that's exactly what I was saying over here that the Laplacian tells you about the difference between the value of the field at the point which is u naught and the average value 
那个警语过来。对。Okay, so the next thing that we're doing is that how do we solve a differential, such a partial differential equation? I'll be taking the example of the of the Laplace equation. Uh, probably because it's the simplest partial differential equation that you could non-trivial simplest non-trivial partial differential equation that has physical applications. Okay, uh, but also because the 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 illustration of the method is very neat in the Laplace equation. Essentially, the method that I'll be talking about, the so-called separation of variable technique, exactly the same method applies. For example, when you're dealing with the diffusion equation or the wave equation, okay, or even the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so the Laplace equation. How do you solve that? Um, before I solve it, okay, let me just make a few comments. Okay, so let's first write on the Laplace equation in two D. So two D, for example, we have this thing in Cartesian coordinates. Okay, the first thing that I would like to emphasize is that the solution u, of course, in general, will be a function of both x and y. It satisfies this. Thing. This differential equation. That's why I'm saying that this is, will be a. If it satisfies this this equation, then of course u of x y is a solution to this equation. Okay. First of all, for a, this this is a second order partial differential equation because you have essentially the, the derivative with respect to x and y both appearing twice. Okay. And this is a linear uh, partial differential equation. If you have a solution. You can again add up two solutions, and that the 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 sum is also a solution, okay. uh, exactly like ordering differential equations. But importantly, the main distinction with ordering differential equations that remember, if you have a linear second order ordering differential equations, then you can write on the general solutions which contains two constants. Okay. That is not the case with partial differential equation. The second order partial differential equation, you cannot write on the general. The the general solution to this partial differential equation with two constants, in fact, with any uh, with any number of constants. Okay, so we have to be so don't take the analogy between ordering differential equation and partial differential equation too far. Okay, in the, even even when you're dealing with linear partial differential equations. Okay, so there are limitations. Okay, partial differential equations are are much more difficult to solve in general than ordering differential equations. Okay, okay. So with that in mind. It's it's a good idea to look at the Laplace equation first of all in generality in detail. Okay, so first of all, let's look at the simplest version of Laplace. And the simplest version, of course, is the one D version. Okay, so the one D version will simply be that. Oh, sorry, the double derivative is zero. The solution, of course, is simply a straight line. The solution is this differential equation, which is an ordering differential equation, because I'm just talking about the Laplace equation in one day. In one day, the Laplace equation becomes a simple second order linear di ordering differential equation. The solution is simply this thing, which is a straight line. And of course, well, it depends on what the value of m x m and c are. You have, you have this as your straight line. That's your solution. Okay. Here it does contain two constants that you can find by specifying some. Initial conditions, some boundary conditions. Okay, but anyway, what the important thing to note over here for us is that there are no local extrema or minima in the solution. Okay, in one D. Okay, because as you can see, a straight line is not going to have a local, uh, local, uh, local extrema. It's not the if there is a minimum or a maximum point, it can only occur at the at the edges of the region that you consider. So, for example, if you are looking at at at, the, at this region, then the maximum point is this, and the minimum point is this. And that occurs at the so the boundaries of this region. Okay, right. This actually property generalizes immediately to two dimensions and three dimensions. Because we know what the Laplacian actually physically extracts, the Laplacian is the difference between u bar and u naught. Okay, and in Laplace equation, where the Laplacian of u is equal to zero, when I say this thing, I'm meaning I'm saying that u, u, u at a particular point is equal to u bar. Okay, now imagine that at a particular point there is, uh, there th there is a maximum. For example, the perfume bottle example. There we had the concentration of the of the of the molecules was maximum at the location of the of the perfume bottle. Okay, 
so imagine that there is a there is extremum point there is a, okay so and if that is the case then just as in the perfume bottle example when you take the average because the neighboring points at the neighboring points the value of u will be smaller okay if you are talking about the maximum point the value of u at the neighboring points will be smaller and then corresponding the average value calculated over small region surrounding this point will be smaller than the value of u at that point itself in a similar way if this point is actually a minimum point then the value of the of u okay at this point uh, will be something but if you take the value of u at neighboring points that will be bigger than than the value of u at this point so when you take the average the average will come to bigger than the value of u at this point okay so if the average value is different from u of of the value of u at the point then of course the laplacian is going to be non zero but we know that the laplacian is zero that means that the only way out of course is that that the average value is the same thing as the value of the field itself and that means it means that there will be no local extreme local maximum or minimum point okay all the the extremum points occur at the at the edges of the region that you talked about okay this property may seem not to be a big deal okay but for example suppose that that i tell you that okay there is some region of space okay and i i specify the function uh, i i say that okay you has you have some scalar field the scalar field satisfies laplace equation within this region and of course to solve this partial differential equation i also need to specify some initial conditions or boundary conditions i what i do is that i specify the value of u at the boundary of this region okay the question is then is that is if i specify u at the boundary of this region is u uniquely determined is that all the information that i need or is more information required there's a there's a similar question to saying that okay if you have a second order linear ordinary differential equation that you need two initial conditions you cannot just tell me for example if you have harmonic oscillator you cannot tell me the position of harmonic oscillator at time t is equal to zero you also need to give me the speed of the harmonic oscillator at time t is equal to zero in order to for me to uniquely specify the position of the harmonic oscillator as a function of time similarly over here is the the information of u at all points of this boundary enough for me to tell you u at points within the boundary okay. The, the the answer is that yes it is enough okay and here's a, here's the proof okay so what you do is that you specify you you assume that there are two different solutions to the laplace equation within the region that you're talking about i i i'll, I'll give you a physical example soon enough okay uh, so for example you might be talking about uh, about two two plates okay Uh, this is example found in in, in the boas book okay so you have two plates these two plates are are at, at some particular temperature while the bottom plate is at a different temperature and you are essentially have to find out the temperature in the region in between okay uh, that separates first the temperature is of course on the scalar field and that actually specifies the laplace equation given the specific specific of temperature on this boundary okay the this these these you can assume to be infinite plate okay The, the 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 other edge is of course at infinity so the, the close boundary so to speak okay well, even though one uh one 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 part of the boundary is at infinity okay so so if you specify the value of the scalar field on the boundary is u uniquely determined okay so suppose you have two different solutions u1 u2 okay specified Uh, that they satisfy this laplace equation with this boundary condition satisfied away with the value of u specified on the boundary okay so then by assumption i know that laplace in u1 is equal to 0 laplace in u2 is equal to 0 because both of these solution i'm saying so as to satisfy this laplace equation what i then do is do subtract these two equations so i have del square of u2 minus u1 is equal to 0 Uh, you can then define u3 is equal to u2 minus u1 so then i have del square of u3 is equal to 0 okay. fine now u3 has value 0 on the boundary because i said that u1 satisfies laplace equation with the boundary condition satisfied so yeah okay on the boundary the value of of this u is is something okay 
uh, at different points it, it can be of course be different value of u2 has exactly the same values okay because of course when i'm saying that two different solutions with the laplace equation exist at points within this boundary the value of the of u at the boundary points of course is the same okay so that is why i'm saying that u3 on the boundary is equal to 0 because u3 by definition is u2 minus u1 u2 has exactly the same values at the boundary as u1 so that's why u3 is equal to 0 so u3 is 0 on the boundary uh, is on the on the boundary at every point of the boundary okay now <coughs> so and u3 also satisfies laplace equation okay now laplace equation as we have seen the only maxima and minima occur at the boundaries okay so if u3 is 0 on the boundaries okay and it's always zero on the boundary then it must be zero throughout the region okay see you can see this immediately from this figure over here so u3 has value zero at this point and u3 has value of zero at this point so if you move inwards okay so suppose if 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 u u3 actually increases as you go from here to here then of course if it increases okay then u3 remember satisfies laplace equation so it if it increases then the value of u3 on the boundary is smaller than the value of of u3 uh, at at a, at a point slightly inside the, the this region okay but then of course you are are, are are then violating this thing that there are no local extrema or minima because if it increases when you move inside then remember it also has to decrease eventually in order to, if you're moving in this in this way, it also has to decrease in order to bring the value of u ba u3 back to zero because u3 remember is zero at this point as well. So then you'll end up if it actually increases, then you'll end up at the maximum point somewhere in between, and that is not true because there is no local extreme or minima. That cannot be true. Similarly, if if you move in this way and the value of u actually decreases as you move inside the region, then of course you'll you'll end up with a local minimum because you have to bring the value of u back to zero. Okay. So u3 has to be zero throughout the region. So if u3 is zero throughout the region, then remember u3 is defined as u2 minus 1. Then throughout the region, u1 is equal to u2. As in, you, uh, you actually don't have two different solutions. You have one and the same solution. Okay. So this is a uniqueness solution, a uniqueness theorem, one uniqueness theorem, the others as well. Okay. And one uniqueness theorem to, uh, for the Laplace equation. Okay. As in, if you if you specify the value of this scalar field that you're looking for, that satisfies the Laplace equation. If you specify the value of the scalar field at the boundaries of the region that you're looking at, that's it. Your solution is uniquely determined. Okay. Let me now actually solve Laplace equation for a physical example. I'll take a simple physical example. So imagine that you have two metallic plates, actually three of them. So if two metallic plates, these two metallic plates, you have to imagine that these are coming out of this, out of the page, okay. So these are infinitely long metallic plates. Of course, in reality, you don't have anything long metallic plates, but essentially you have finite metallic plates, but I'm looking at points far away from the edges, so I can model these, 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 these metallic plates as far as the points that I'm interested in, okay, because I'm looking at points far away from the edges. Uh, if I'm looking at uh, at the place at point if, from the perspective of points far away from the edges, then the place might as well be infinite. Okay, so, uh, so you have two infinite uh, metallic plates. Okay, You're going infinitely up, going infinitely down. Okay, this is I'm looking at from the front. Okay, so essentially this plate is coming out of the page. Both of these okay, are coming out of the page. Infinity long out of the page as well. Infinity long out of the page as well. And then there's a third plate, okay, which is insulated from these two plates. So you need to have these are metallic plates. You need to insulate them. Otherwise, all three plates will be at exactly the same potential. Okay. So you have this third plate, okay, right? And so that's what you have. Okay? So let me draw another diagram illustrating the situation. Okay. So you have this coordinate system, so you have x, y, z, okay. and you essentially have over here uh, 
I can only draw a draw section. Okay, over here. So you have here, and you have uh, uh, here, of course, right? And we have over here. Okay. So these these this 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 curvy line just shows that this is just a segment that I have drawn. Okay, this actually goes uh, goes up goes up. Okay, uh, right, and uh, this thing goes. Okay, so this is actually uh, something like this. Okay, and you also have right this. Uh, the, the back of these is uh, is joined like this okay so that's what you have um, right so you have over here right so the back of these is joined like that okay so you have these two plates coming out okay now uh, what the physical situation uh, corresponds with that we talk about is that these two plates, these two, okay, this and this, are both ground. Physically, that that just means that I, I can set the potential at these two plates to be zero, okay. and the potential at the back plate, this plate at the back, this plate at the back, is in my control. Okay. Um, right, so the the potential at the back plate, of course, is is this is uh, this is let me denote that as v. Okay. Um, right, so this is the, the, the this potential is is in my control. The potential at the back plate. Okay, so I can write the potential at the back plate as some function of y. Okay, right. So I am assuming that the potential on the back plate, okay, I have drawn some points over here to show it. Uh, I am assuming that the potential on the back plate uh, is, is only a function of y. So the potential at this red point is different from the potential at this black point over here. Okay, it can be different, it may be the same. Okay, but the potential on the, uh, the blue point is the same as the potential at the red point. So the potential is independent of the z coordinate in the back plate. It can depend on y. It may not depend on y, as in the potential can be constant throughout the back plate. Okay, so that's what I'm assuming. Uh, now, I have to, uh, now I have to specify the actual, uh, what, what do I have to find? Okay, so essentially I have to solve the Laplace equation. Subject to some boundary condition to specify. So I have to find this function v, okay, and it's only a function going to be only a function of x and y. It's effectively a two-dimensional problem. The potential cannot depend on z, okay, because the the pro because I'm dealing with infinite uh, infinite plates, okay. The problem cannot depend on the z coordinate because, as you can see, if you stand on the red red or red point. The, 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 the surroundings are exactly the same as if you stand on the blue at the, at the blue point okay where that's exactly why uh, that's because essentially the potential on the back plate is only a function of the y coordinate okay so you are dealing with infinite plates okay the the the, uh, the, the potential cannot depend on z so effectively you're dealing with a two-dimensional problem as in v is only a function of x and y no matter what the value of z if the value of x and y is the same you get the same potential okay okay so v is a function of x and y and now it is and that's what i have to find uh, so i have to solve laplace equation to extract v of x and y of course i have to specify the boundary conditions so essentially i specify the value of v on the boundaries of the region um, which comprises of the left plate, the right plate, the back plate, and the front plate. The front plate is actually at infinity. Okay, and I know once I specify the value of the potential on uh, on this boundary, then the potential is uniquely determined by solving the Laplace equation. Okay, so the the boundary conditions essentially looking at this coordinate system that I've set up, the the spacing between the plates I've denoted as a. So. Um, uh, the boundary condition is simply that v is equal to zero at x at sorry at y is equal to zero. Okay, so that's the left plate. V is equal to zero at y is equal to a. 
that's the right word v is equal to v not y at x is equal to 0 that's the back plate and physically I know that for the front plate which is actually at infinity the potential has to drop to 0 okay. so these are my boundary conditions now I just have to solve Laplace equation subject to these boundary conditions okay and the method to solve Laplace equation is is goes by the name of uh, the usual method is to is, is to apply the, the separation of variables technique the idea is this that we are dealing with a two variable function you assume that the solution is of this form. this the same technique applies to the wave equation the diffusion equation and so on so let me explain what this means you assume that the solution is of the form of a function only of x which is capital x and a function only of y which is capital y of course you will say that okay how do you know the solution is of this form I don't okay and usually the solution is not of this form. but the idea is that if I am able to find the solution find solutions of this form then I can add up these solutions to find out the solution that I want okay uh, you because you're dealing with a linear partial differential equation so you know that the sum of those of solutions is also going to be a solution okay uh, you are dealing with a homogeneous linear partial differential equation okay so uh, let's now write down the Laplace equation that I'm looking at. So we have this thing. This equals zero. Okay. Now you just plug this thing into the Laplace equation. Okay. Okay. So you substitute this in, and what you will get, of course, is that the the, the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to x does not see y, and the partial derivative with respect to y does not see capital X. Okay. So you will get essentially capital Y the derivative of X capital X with respect to X plus uh, X the derivative of capital Y with respect to Y this is equal to 0 okay uh, so you see the, the, the simplification we have we have started from a partial differential equation we are now going towards ordinary differential equation those we are comfortable with that's why I spend so much time on ordinary differential equation because Partial differential equation in practice, if you're doing physics or engineering, most of the time you deal with separation of variables, and that very quickly leads to ordinary differential equations. Okay. Okay. Fine. Then, uh, then the then the next step that you divide throughout this equation, like what we need, capital V number is just capital X times capital Y. But the right hand side, of course, remains zero when you divide by capital V. You divide by capital X times capital Y, you end up with one over X. Y. This, okay. and now comes the key step in the separation of uh, variables technique okay here's here's the logic okay uh, what you say is that the first term is only a function of x right and the second term is only a function of y for all points x and y this equation has to be true because remember you are assuming that capital X times capital Y which is equal to V satisfies Laplace equation okay so this equation has to be satisfied for all points X and Y okay. so suppose now going back the Laplace equation is satisfied for this right point okay I can move from the right point to the uh, to the black point Okay, so I don't move into or, I don't move into or out of the page. I only move in the right direction. So in the in in otherwise I only change y. I don't change x. If I only change y and I don't change x, then of course the first term I don't touch the first term. I only touch the second term. Okay, so presumably if the second term changes, the first term does not change. Okay, but this equation still has to be satisfied. If it was satisfied at the red point, as it was by assumption then the only way that this can be satisfied for the black point as well if, is is if the second term actually did not change okay? because if it did change then it's no longer going to be then this equation is no longer going to be satisfied because it was initially satisfied and now if one of those terms changes and the first term does not change then there's no way that this equation can still be satisfied so the second term is actually then 
the only way that this equation can be satisfied is if the circuit level actually does not change which means that this is a constant similarly you can then you can also imagine moving from the red point to a point slightly out of the pitch so in other words you are changing x but not y then only the first term changes the second term does not change okay but this equation still has to satisfy satisfy so the first term can only be uh, can can only be a constant it cannot depend on x okay otherwise this equation cannot be satisfied so what we say then is that this thing is a constant the first term is a constant c1 and this thing is another constant c2 so c1 plus c2 is equal to 0 okay or in other words c2 is simply equal to minus c1 so actually there is only one constant over here okay and then i can then say that okay 1 over x equals c1 1 over y Minus C. Okay. Uh, and now I, these two equations of course are very familiar should be very familiar these two are the harmonic oscillator equations uh, but I have to make sure that the boundary conditions are satisfied okay uh, can be satisfied okay so y so v is 0 at y is equal to 0 v is 0 at y is equal to a and the v approaches 0 as x approaches infinity okay so the x dependence should not be sinusoidal, the y dependence should be sinusoidal because you have know that y is equal to 0 and y is, y is equal to a, okay. So, so c1 is a positive constant so that I don't get sinusoidal solution so let me just write this thing as, so let me write c1 as k, specify that. C1 is a po is a positive constant. Okay, so then I have k square and x. Okay, I've chosen to write down the constant this way, with uh, so that uh, I get the solutions which can satisfy the boundary conditions. Okay, so now you see the advantage of separation of variables. I've converted my partial differential equation into do ordering differential equations okay now you just solve the, these differential equations capital x of course is simply given by some constant e raised to power kx plus b e raised to power minus kx okay, that's the solution to this differential equation okay, you differentiate this twice you get k is k r. okay and the uh, the, the, the solution to this equation, of course, is, is, is sinusoidal. Sine plus d plus k y. Okay. So, my v, the separable solutions are of this form. And now I choose these constants a, b, c, and d such that these uh, these conditions can be satisfied. Okay, uh, these boundary conditions over here. Okay, right. So first of all, you know that v has to approach zero as x approaches infinity. Okay, right. So you are assuming that over here. Um, so as x approaches infinity. Um, uh, v has to approach 0 which means that this thing that a has to be equal to 0 okay. otherwise v will blow up okay right so you are left with this thing over here then you also know that v is 0 and uh, y is equal to 0 okay uh, that's one of the boundary conditions so that immediately means that d has to be 0 okay right and so you are left with I haven't, still haven't used all of the boundary conditions, so I can call, I can relabel this uh, this this constant b times c as simply a. Okay, this new a. Okay, not the same as the previous a. 
so you have this okay fine and now I also have the boundary condition that y is equal to a v is equal to 0 okay. so okay if that is true then I must have that sign ky has to be equal to 0 this means that of course the ky must be equal to n times pi so so uh, oh sorry uh, this means that it's very right, really weird okay sign of Uh, k a is equal to n pi so k is simply equal to n pi, pi over a so k cannot be anything it's actually equal to integer multiples of pi over a okay okay uh, great so now going back my v x y is equal to constant e ratio of minus kx so let me just rewrite that as well minus n pi x over a and i also have sine of n pi y over a that's what i have okay finally i also need that v x equals to 0, y should be equal to v not y, which is some function that, that is specified to me initially. That's just the potential profile of the back plate. Okay, and this for my solution is going to be simply equal to a sine of n pi y over a. And now you enter, because you know that this can be any function, any nice smooth function whatsoever. This in general is not going to be a sinusoidal function. So there's no way that you can find out a in general such that uh, a in general that actually satisfies this equation because remember a is just some constant okay it's not going to be fun it's not a function of x and y okay but but and here's the catch the you have found solutions v x y of this one right okay where n is any integer okay fine and you are dealing with a linear partial differential equation okay so the the sum of these solutions will also satisfy laplace equation with the boundary conditions that you have specified in other words in other words you can check that this thing where n uh, where n is an integer satisfies the plus equation with the boundary conditions that we have written down okay uh, fine uh, and by the way is not going to be a negative integer otherwise you won't satisfy that boundary condition that we approaches zero as x approaches infinity okay uh, fine so uh, so n is zero one two three and so on okay fine Right. But, but you also don't want n is equal to 0 because if n is equal to 0 then of course the the whole thing is uh, okay, over here you are, when you had uh, when, when n is equal to 0 you will get 0 anyway okay? because sine of 0 is going to be 0 so you might as well start this sum from n is equal to 1 all the way to infinity so this thing also satisfies Laplace equation because like I said before the sum of, of your, your separable solution is also going to satisfy Laplace equation okay right. and then the idea then is of course that now you can find this collection of coefficients here not just a single constant you can find a collection of these of these constants such that this equation can be satisfied Okay, so as in v not y is not just equal to a times sine n pi y over a, it's actually v not y is equal to 
the, this collection of coefficients that you have to find out okay as you uh, okay so let's use that so in this thing let's put x is equal to zero so then you have n is equal to one to infinity and you have a n and you have x is equal to zero so the exponential goes away and you have n pi y over a and this thing has to be equal to v naught y okay so then you just have to solve for this this correction of a n okay and this is where Fourier series comes in okay you already know how to do this mm -hmm. remember the this these signs and to extract this a n this is exactly the same game that we played when we were dealing with Fourier series okay you multiply you can multiply both sides with 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 sign of m p uh, m pi y over a and then integrate over y from zero to a okay so the sum like that goes outside uh, this a n goes outside and you have zero to a sign m pi y over a sign m pi y over a and this of course you have to do the same thing on the the right hand side okay and as you saw when we did dealing with Fourier series this thing is equal to 0 if n is not equal to m and this thing is equal to a by 2 if n is equal to m okay. so what we have then is essentially you pick up essentially a chronic delta so you get a m a over 2 okay is equal to 0 to a dy d not y sin m pi y over a when otherwise just relabeling re -labeling a m as a n this is going to be simply 2 over a 0 to a dy v not y sin of n pi y y so that's it okay the solutions to the Laplace equation Wait on, hang on. Okay. Solution to your Laplace equation with the boundary conditions you have specified is simply this thing. Okay. So this is n is equal to 1 to infinity a n e raised to power minus n pi x over a sine of n pi y over a, where these a n's are given by this sp above. Okay. Fine. Uh, so we can do a special case. Let's take the special case where this potential is actually not dependent on y. It's just some constant. Okay. And then I can immediately figure out these coefficients a n. So a n is simply equal to well v naught then goes outside the integral. So you get two v naught over a zero to a dy sine n pi y over a. Okay. So this is 2 v naught over a, this integral gives you a over n pi of course and you get uh, cosine of n pi y over a and you get the integral from 0 to a and this thing is going to give you 2 v naught over n pi and even y is equal to a you're going to get cosine of n pi and cosine of n pi is minus 1 raised to power n okay and we have minus 1 okay so this thing a n is going to be 0 if if n is is 2 4 6 8 so all for the odd for the even ends this is 0 and this thing is going to be a n is going to be uh, minus 4 v naught over n pi for n is equal to 1, 3, 5 and so on. Okay. Uh, oops, this should not be negative. Uh, okay. Uh, because my a ends. Uh, oh, okay. I've done uh, I've done a mistake over here. This should be a negative sign because of course when I integrate sign I get minus cosine. This be that. This okay, fine. So, uh, so my v x y then is simply given by you go back and you have 4 v naught over 
by n is equal to 1, 3, 5, and so on, all the way to infinity. Okay, and you have 1 over n. This is from a n, okay. This is 1 over n from a n, and you have e raised to power minus n by x over a sine of n by y over a. That's it. Okay, that is your solution. Okay, so you can then find out your the, the value of the electric potential at any point in between the plates. Okay, right. So, <laughs> boss, by the way, does a very similar problem. Uh, where she considers essentially uh, you have two two plates with some temperature so the, the temperature at this plate is the same as the temperature at this plate at the bottom plate there is some different temperature and then it turns out that you, to find out the temperature in green and in between you have to solve the Laplace equation for the temperature so it's exactly the same way okay. so the idea being that, that uh, with very different physical scenarios you can end up with the same partial differential equation and then of course the, the, the mathematics is exactly the same okay so that's the beauty of mathematical physics that different physical problems lead to the same mathematics okay and the same solution techniques okay? uh, one other point that i would like to point out that you can also of course also do separation of variable techniques as spherical polar coordinates or, or cylindrical coordinates there you would be writing you would be writing for example in spherical polar coordinates you would say that the solution of the order of the form capital r which is only a function of the radial coordinate times capital theta which is only a function of uh, polar coordinate theta and then you have capital phi which is only a function of square phi okay so that, that's the form of the solution in spherical polar coordinates usually when you do this uh, you end up with the ordering differential equation in spherical polar coordinates in the problem in its spherical symmetry that those are the coordinates that you would like to use and the ordering differential equation that you end up is, is the general differential equation Okay, so that's uh, where the legendary differential equation we studied before comes in useful. Uh, if you do so, uh, if you do a problem with cylindrical symmetry, and uh, then of course you're using a similar problems, uh, similar solution form of solution, but in cylindrical coordinates, and then the ordering differential equation that you end up with uh, is the Bessel equation. Okay, so uh, so the ordering differential equation that we did before in detail are extremely useful. Okay, that those are the stepping stone to solving these. This partial differential equation, but the but the, the 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 essence of the method separation of variables should be clear now. Okay. Uh, solving other differential partial differential equations like the wave equation and so on are as we subject to of course these boundary conditions are of course just variations of this of this technique that we have just done. Okay, so no need to be so afraid if whenever you see a partial differential equation. Okay, and. Uh, uh, in the in the exam and so on, I won't ask you to solve uh, complicated differential equation. But the idea being that this, since this is a take, it will be a take home exam. You should be able to uh, to trace to to solve it. Given that I give uh, that I provided provide you with enough guidance in the question. Okay, I haven't made the final exam yet, so I don't know. Okay, let's see. Okay, uh, but if you understood this. The, the, the way I solve this this Laplace equation you should be fine. Okay, okay, and that's it. Okay, so uh, that's the end of uh, no more no more videos after this.